Jack is Jack. Joey, don't you think you're being just a little bit too hard on the franchise? Can't you see that this franchise is a man with a broken heart? Put yourself in his place. Haven't you ever had your heart broken? No, I'm the man who goes out there in just a few short minutes to achieve my destiny as a heavyweight champion of the world. But I can't help but think of Shane Douglas, a broken man. And despite what he may have said about his addiction to women, I have to know what broke Shane's heart was not a woman, was not a female being. It was the belt! See, Shane, you don't have a weakness for the women, although you might like the world to think so. You've got a weakness for the gold. That little symbol that tells you you are an important man in this world, Shane, that you're not a mid-card wrestler. Well, I'll stand here right now, and I'll tell you you're not a mid-card wrestler. What you are right now is the link in my journey to the heavyweight championship of the world. And, Shane, i got to face the fact that you are a man with an obsession for that belt that makes O.J. Simpson look like a matrimonial philanthropist. So, Shane, you don't look at Cactus Jack and say, hey, my best friend is on his way to fulfill his destiny. You look at it like, hey, my best friend's trying to nail my old girl, and he might do it better than me. Well, Shane, snap out of it and call this one down the line or I'll send you down the line on a very rocky road to Stanford. Bang, bang! Here you have it from the challenger, Cactus Jack. Tonight, it's our television show. We had! We had! Say what? Vocabulary too. Uh, I'm a history of this tradition is all brand new. new. Yeah. You're through. I'm interplanetary uh, like Doctor Who. Who, who. So who? Fuck your beef. No relief. I step on stage. Girls scream like I'm Keith. Yo, everybody. Ring time. Pro wrestling is at it again. It is Keith in the building without Keisha. Keisha will be back next week. This week she is taking care of some personal business. Um, she is in transition in the professional world and cannot join us for this wonderful wonderful preview of wwe extreme rules um i will guide you through this thing as best as i can this week um as we talk about everything wrestling that has been going on and get you geared up for a top-notch pay-per-view called extreme rules i'm not sure if it's gonna be top-notch but right now it looks like we got a lot going on and we can expect a lot from the wwe this time so i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that we are going to have a stellar pay-per-view um so without further ado it is our preview uh, raw was monday and they pretty much was the go-home show live from greensboro north carolina rick flair country uh, Greensboro Coliseum um, If you are familiar with the WCW In the Crockett area A very important venue And a very important building In the history of professional wrestling Home of the first Starcade, Home of the first Clash of the Champions uh, The place where Sting and Flair Started their thing Right? Greensboro So We kick it off um, We open up the show Of course is Reigns and AJ And I'll say this I'm not a fan of Roman on the mic And I almost feel like He is the spokesperson For why we need managers back in wrestling But The dynamic between him and AJ Has been very good AJ has brought out the best Of Roman Reigns And I think they have a natural chemistry That is totally understated I mean them two together Is magic And now having that layered feud Between them, the Usos in the club I think also Has this interesting element Because there's so much going on right there Right Like when you watch Roman Reigns You see this Guy who's kind of still in the baby face world But you know he wants to be a heel But he's rolling with two guys Who are clearly still obvious baby faces Right Well flip it on the other side AJ Styles Consummate baby face but he's rolling with two guys who are obvious heels. 
and the worlds collide they get complicated as each person is trying to basically still achieve their ultimate goal and be world champ right so there's that uh the contrast in wrestling styles is incredible mind you you know roman still has some limited limitations in the ring but with a seasoned vet like aj i think those things are masked very well um, I think they've had too much interaction over the past few weeks. I still stand by that. I think I would like a world where they had less interaction. But still in all, they have maintained a very healthy storyline being around each other as much as they are. Um, and facing off every week. And this week was no exception. Um, the club and the Usos had matches with uh, Roman and AJ outside in their respective corners. And all in all, it was a good match. I think um, the club is obviously the better team. Gallows and Anderson are headed towards those tag team titles, and they are headed towards a lot of big things. I think I'm not saying anything negative of the Usos, but I think when you see the just the the, the vibe, Anderson and Gallows really got this team thing down. So I, that's all I'm pretty much giving out of that. Like they pretty much got this team thing down. Okay. But one thing I will say interesting about the feud Monday, um, we finally got to see AJ Styles get nasty. Because the thing is, we got Extreme Rules. We got the Extreme Rules match coming up Saturday, and I think they did it right. Like they held it back. I think we proved Roman could be ruthless. We proved Roman could be deadly um, with the Triple H feud. And the things that he did to Triple H leading up to WrestleMania. Uh, I don't know if the, the, the WWE fans are that familiar with AJ Styles. And AJ Styles still as a, a brand and an entity has still never been that guy who's, I'm dangerous to the point of your career could be over. AJ has just always been, I am dangerous because I could beat you in the ring one, two, three. Well, this was a little bit more about extreme rules and the fact that, hey, Things are going to be legal, and I'm going to be swinging a chair. And I think he established that point, like, when push comes to serve, I can leave you bloody, too. And I thought that was a good tone to set out on Monday and help create some doubt on the possibility of who or who may not win that match. Because here's the thing. I think going into it, the obvious choice is that Roman Reigns still holds on. And, hey, if Roman Reigns wins and you squeeze two pay-per-views out of him and AJ's feud... And still had had a good feud. A man creative, you did the job. Because I'm pretty sure when Seth Rollins comes back, he's the next man in line. But, um, which also, I think you have to hate some Roman Reigns heel turn because Seth Rollins is coming back as a babyface, right? Like, I don't, I, I don't think that's a stretch. Now, because we don't have a heel authority right now, uh, you maybe really ain't got to do all that. So, We'll see how it all turns around Because we can just act like the authority is just this thing In the past and a figment of our imaginations Because hey who needs heels in charge I think the idea of Steph And Shane right now doing the dynamic Duo thing is pretty cool um, I like what Steph is doing Because nobody trusts her It's kind of like As fans everybody's watching the, Waiting for the other shoe to flip But it hasn't She's so shockingly good I mean, when people present her prowess backstage, he's being fair and balanced. She has, she doesn't have an agenda right now, and it's very weird for people to watch because anybody who's been familiar with that character, there's always an agenda. There's always an angle, and right now there just doesn't appear to be a reason for that angle. And it's just that right now, all of a sudden, she's supporting her brother who's been gone for X amount of years and just been back to this and. We don't know what, where, why, or how, but right now everybody's impressed with what's going on. And the idea right now, Shane is back, but we don't know for how long. So I don't know what will be the determining factor of how we hasten or move a storyline to alter and respect the kind of situation. Um, going forward, Ross saw a debut match of. One of the new NX, women from NXT, Dana Brooke, has hit the main roster. And she's hit it with fire. Um, I believe Emma's injured. So this is maybe one of the reasons why it's just Dana by herself. But she took on Becky Lynch and scored an upset victory. 
I think that is huge kicking her off in Raw. Somebody who you beat somebody who's been intricately a part of challenging for the women's title. So now, hey, you can look up whether you're ready or not and say, what about me? Get some eyes on me. So good job, Dana. I think it's that division is so strong. Um, I know we haven't seen Sasha Banks in a while, but just word FYI, she's around. Um, she's wrestling on the dark shows. Um, she's just been kept off TV for a while for uh, something else going on in the storyline. Which, man, if they're going to keep people off of TV for a minute to help enhance the story, good job, WWE. Great job. I think it's something that you should have been experimenting with a long time ago. I think it's something that you guys should be understanding. I think we need to work out some kind of rotation, working rotation amongst the wrestlers. And almost to the point of this. Hey, um, SummerSlam, that WrestleMania through SummerSlam week is the week when everybody's in the building. Everybody's live. Everybody a part of what's going on. But after that, hey, man, we got to get this rotation. Because you can lose and miss certain people at certain times and it not affect the overall agenda of what's going on. And if those things are staggered out, I think you come up with a nice thing. Also, with more time and more vacation. You can get a fresher talent base And then maybe we can dial back some of these injuries Just a thought, right? Just a thought as I'm randomly going through this show called Raw um, Also from my notes here um, Rusev looked good on Monday Which I was shocked I've, I haven't seen Rusev look like Rusev in like five months You know, ever since the whole thing broke with him and Lana And the engagement and stuff like that It's been rough on your boy I mean, he been taking whippings that I don't think. No. First of all, they put him in League of Nations, and League of Nations is, was a faction that had all the potential in the world, but it had the WWE creative team behind it, right? Because it's just too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many people have a, competing agendas. Too many people want to do certain things, and you deal with the volatility of eighteen, nineteen year olds until you know the draft starts shaking out a little bit more. And on paper. There's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of cause of optimism. But hey man, for anything taught me about life, they still clippers. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> See how it is. Just between being a Laker and being a clipper. That's all I got for you. Um Yeah. So but back to what I'm saying. Rusev looked really strong. Um, League of Nations, like I said, was constructed really bad. And I think there was no long-term attention. So, you had Sheamus, who was a de facto leader. And they weren't really interested in pushing him, so he kept taking L's. Uh, Del Rio was your U.S. champ, but then they took him off of him. And your boy Kalisto is busting up the League of Nations as it, as it goes. Uh, did he get down to... Uh, the real losing his belt Did Wade Barrett was leaving And that was one of the reasons why he was leaving He was just getting misused and miscast And even as King Barrett they didn't get that out of it So it was like Okay he's just sitting here And then Rusev Rusev was a monster man Like that solo run When he first came in Running with the US title Is probably one of the best most dominant runs to open up a career But then it stalled out They had never really given the match against Sting Like they wanted and they never really took care of business in the eyes of a lot of people. So, things didn't never work out like that. But, one thing about Rusa, he got punished. That was the real deal with him, is that he was just getting punished. He was in a situation where, hey, your girl did something that we didn't like, and you was in the picture, so you're going to have to eat these L's. And it was one thing because... They didn't like it because it, it killed a storyline. Now, to be fair, it killed a horrible storyline, but it killed the storyline for them. And it seemed like they ain't never forgave him, right? Now, he's in the Ryback slot since Ryback is kind of chilling on shelf right now. And guess what? Rusev been taking them losses for Ryback. But on Monday, we felt like we saw old Rusev. Monday we felt like we saw a guy that was intimidating That could beat people And he was there He was helping Del Rio out Del Rio had a match against uh, Kalisto Carl was there 
And they beat them two little dudes Like hey Y'all told me this was punching practice I don't But <laughs> It all worked out And you know what I'm saying Now we'll see How it goes into extreme rules Because He's gonna lose As good as he looked Monday I think it's just it. You can't have Somebody coming into a pay per view Every month Without the compelling idea That hey They might be able to take one of these To the crib Right like I'm not watching all these people ride in and waiting on the bus. Somebody got to take this to the crib. So it is what it is. Uh, also in the news and the new, um, I like the chemistry between Owen, Cesaro, Zayn, and Miz. Um, that erupted into a brawl on Monday, which they have a good habit of always erupting in a brawl. And right now we have four, we have three we got one champ and three legit contenders all vying for not just time but even affection because I think they socialize as being affected by trying to sit out here and trying to make stuff happen. You know what I mean? Like they're in the different ball areas or whatever and trying to make it work. But yo, yo, these guys really have a natural chemistry. They have built their rivalries. Miz is kind of the oddball out, but it's cool. Uh, he ain't part of Click. He didn't come up through ROH. He didn't come through the Indies like everybody else. His Indies were a little bit different. Um, but he's there. He's he's making it work. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, did you mess around and you got? I'm gonna check that out too. But yeah, I mean, with I don't know who to root for in the Fatal Four Way. What I do find interesting is that with those three guys, Miz is the least likable, and he is a perfect heel in that mix because, hey man, people just can't stand Miz. Now, he also has his wife, Bay Reese, who's a different kind of heel. It's the I pretty heel, and I won't talk to you, you peasant heel. And I think she'll do a good job. I wish her a lot of both watch some more Missy Hyatt, but that's neither here nor there. Um, It'd be interesting to see how this feud breaks out Because it can't stay the four of them forever But what it has done Is it made a legitimate division Surrounding one title Because you got four people vying for that division As serious candidates So now coming four people coming in Have to first try to be better than those serious candidates To even get a look to go to the next thing So uh, Just be a kind of interesting way How to look at things and how things are going Right Uh you know, one of the most interesting and most impressive things I thought about Raw on Monday was the contracts. The contracts have between Natty and Charlotte. Now, to be fair, and I've said this numerous times on this program, I hate the current state of contract signs, and I wish they stopped doing them. Um, it's something I think is overplayed. I think it's overdone. I think we've gotten to the point of we know how this is going to end. Somebody's going to flip at the table, and it's going to be something. And I think to make them special again, we just got to hold off. We got to stop doing contract signs and stuff for like it's WrestleMania or SummerSlam. And it got to be for one of the world titles. Everything else does not need a contract signing for a time. Man, you look at the, to try to get the title and you're trying to win that backlash or something. Hey, you, you just don't get a title. Sorry. You barely got people visiting to see the show or cheerleaders. So you should be happy. Yep, I said it. Fight me. Ringtimeprowrestlinggmail.com. You can fight me. Um, or bite me. Either way. But yeah, um, but the, it was the one thing that I took from it was this is how we closing the show. This is essentially the main event. Good job, WWF, being progressive, realizing how to use those different volumes of television you didn't help down all these years. So it looks like it's gonna be you know a good solid down there. But um, with that being said. Uh, I think it's going to be time for the first break of Ring Time. And we'll come back with the news, the notes, and the breakdown of what to expect at Extreme Rules. And basically a little bit of history and background on the wonderful event that we know as Extreme Rules. So with that, like I said, catch you on the other side of the break. And anybody, anywhere, that does not fear the name of the almighty Abdullah the Butcher is either an insane fool or they're lying to you. 
This man that you see is not an ordinary being. He has reigned terror in the Russian nation. He has reigned terror in the wrestling business for more years than any man. There ain't a single human being that can say deep in their heart that they do not fear the baddest of the bad, the biggest of the big, the black terror that is going to change things at TBS. He's here for a purpose. He's here for a reason. Everybody that has shunned me, that has made light of me, the black monster will take care of everything. Cause there's only one, Abdullah the Butcher, the real boogeyman has arrived on TBS. So we flip it up on the other side of the break for Ringtime Pro Wrestling. Um, this is a, a Keith Solo show. I uh, hope y'all are enjoying the ride so far. Um, so we are in our birthday segments, and you know, this is one of my favorite times. I love to talk about the birthdays, whose birthday it is in wrestling right now. Um, today, when the show drops, it will be May 20th. That means yesterday would have been May 19th, and that would have been the birthday of the late, great Andre the Giant. Um, Andre would have been 70 today. Um, today, Road Dog Jesse James. Um, Brian James, uh, one half of the New Age Outlaws, uh, former known as Rhodey, part of the great Armstrong family, uh, current agent with the WWE, I think he's producer for SmackDown. He will turn 46 today, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, or actually 47. Um, and tomorrow, which would be Saturday, uh, the late Chris Benoit would have celebrated a birthday. Uh, Benoit would have been 49. Um, Brian Pillman ce- would have celebrated a birthday also on Sunday. Uh, he would have turned 51. Wow. No, I'm sorry, 54. Brian Pillman would have turned 54. Coincidentally, Brian Pillman shares a birthday with uh, the, at least this is for first living guy I'm talking about, Daniel Bryan. Uh, Daniel Bryan is going to be 35 on Sunday. So, send out a tweet, tell the man happy birthday, let him know to stay up. We're still proud of him and happy, you know, he enjoying his life and I guess him and Bree are living in holy matrimony and, you know what I mean, whatever. Well, I don't say holy matrimony because everybody ain't holy and everybody believes in the holy thing. So, they just happily married. How about that? And, you know, if they want to have kids, hopefully they have kids. If not, you know, whatever, whatever, right? I'm just rambling. But let's get to the news, man. The news is always interested. Um, the aforementioned Andre the Giant. Uh, there is a planned biopic for Andre the Giant out there in the works, and they are currently casting for it now. As uh, far as I know, it's not a WWE project. But it is a big deal. I'm sure WWE have a lot of influence on the project because they own all the footage. And I'm sure, you know, Vince would be heavily involved and in make sure that the proper footage is put out there. And you got to you gotta understand here, too. The love that they have for Andre, I'm sure they're going to take, they, everybody's going to take care of him at WWF, right? Um,. Uh, this might be one of the more important biopics ever in wrestling. Not that there have been a lot of biopics in wrestling, if there are any worth noting. But Andre changed the business. Like, Andre literally is the first grand box office attraction I think the business had seen. Um, for a lot of years and for a long time, the business was, you know, bingo halls. It was... You know, small venues, they would do a big show at a, you know, maybe a nice theater, you know, regionally, but Andre took it to the next level. And he is one of the key components and probably the most responsible component for the modern expansion of professional wrestling. 
Because without the 1987 WrestleMania three match with Hogan, I mean, I think that is the they particular main event. Because that's the event that draws the house. That's the event that puts 91,000 in the Pontiac Silverdome in Pontiac, Michigan, coincidentally my hometown. Uh, and draws millions of pay-per-view customers, right? That's the one. That's the one that turns heads. Because if you're not into wrestling, but you're a businessman, and you see something that could put 91,000 people in the venue, and you just start doing math, like, shit, $10 a ticket. Damn, we done made a million dollars already. Wow. Okay. So, and you know them tickets ain't $10, especially down on the lower level. So, you realize the gate and the possibility of box office in that situation. And you're like, this guy helped do it? And really, that's the thing. You got to remember, Hogan is incredible as the hero until he beats Andre. I don't say he's incredible, but there's always would be this looming figure outside if he never beats Andre. Because Andre is still the most famous man in wrestling to this point. The marketing machine that produces Hulk Hogan is amazing and it puts him out there. But it the wrestling fans still at that point it was about Andre. Andre had never lost. He was the main attraction in all the territories. I mean they used him very well. He was always very well protected. He always stayed traveling. He always didn't do too much time in each place. They always brought him in on major shows, battle royals, things like that. Like he never did a lot of Cheap shows He always was at your big events Your big stadium shows He was a larger in life attraction And uh, I wish I would have got to see him in his younger years Because I A lot of things that we talk about Like with the big show With the agility and things like that uh, People talked about Andre But I never really got a chance to see it Now Even in his later years Where he You know he had suffered a lot of back injuries He had a lot of leg injuries um, He still knew how to masterfully Maneuver himself in the ring He had certain spots he liked to hit He made he made it all work No matter who he was in there with He made it work um, That Hogan rivalry Like I said was a catalyst To the modern industry In which We transitioned into the cable networks And the pay per views and that kind of thing And it was the one thing that helped Probably consolidate the territories And things like that because the WWE was a fixture It was there to stay At that point I mean Wrestlemania 1 Was very huge Wrestlemania 2 was huge But 3 Vince bet the farm again And he won And a lot of that Goes to Andre So like I said I think Andre kind of I'm not going to say He was an unsung hero But I think As time has moved on And the younger generations Have gotten further away From Andre Because the thing is Like Right now, like if you're 20, you were born in 1996. You never seen Andre, really. He just was a guy that you heard about. Um, cause so if you're 25 or something like that, it's just not really. I don't think it resonates with you. I'm 36, about to be 37, and I saw Andre at the later portion of him, and I didn't get like prime Andre. So I can't imagine what it's. But I know, like I said. For I know a lot of people didn't do a really good job of keeping his story alive as much, and so I think this biopic is really important, and I think it'd be it's going to be an incredible addition. And I think one thing he's important enough as a wrestler to get a biopic. Not I don't know how many wrestlers have permeated pop culture enough to warrant a biopic. Uh, Ric Flair probably will go on that list. Hulk Hogan will go on that list. Um, and then after that, I mean, we start going to Slim Pickens. I, I don't know who permeates prop culture to the point of a time. I think you can make it as one for Dusty, but I don't know if it sells right away. I think it's something that you, if you watch it, you could catch on and say, oh, wow, that's why that guy was so important. But I think out the gate, you get an idea that Andre already had that thing going for him. So I think the, that's why I, I, I'm telling you the Andre biopic. I think it will do a lot, and I think it's going to do a lot for the next tier of wrestlers who will come along. And that may warrant the idea of somebody telling the story of their life. Right? Also, Andre, just 
the overcoming of the giantism and that whole thing and learning about that and the disease that he suffered from that had him constantly growing and that kind of thing. I think that's something that's like worth noting and learning about. So, like I said, I think the Andre biopic is definitely a winner and definitely something that people would like to see. Um, also in the news, Vince McMahon sells over thirty million dollars worth of his WWE shares. Uh, apparently, the chairman uh, has sold officially sold two million one hundred eighty-one thousand eight hundred ninety-four shares of his WWE stock, um, worth uh, a little over thirty million. The report state the official reason McMahon was selling the stock was due to purposes of involving estate planning. Gotta remember, Vince is seventy years old, right? So, when you're seventy years old, you gotta be thinking about what's the next step. So. Probably for his estate How things are lined up Certain things may need to get paid off Certain things may need to be liquid May need to be however he needs to do it Because he's got to chop it up between Linda, Steph, and Shane And the grandkids And however he Plan to let his fortune go You know what I mean um, But trust me I That still He's going to have the WWE in a good place Um now it's said McMahon has a total of uh, 37 million shares left of WWE stock, which represents approximately 48% of the company. For over the better part of the last 50 years, McMahon has owned as much as 63% of the company prior to sales over the past few years. So he's incrementally sold more and more stock. Now, but he's always kept probably above that 50% threshold just in case some kind of investment breaker, broker or somebody came in and tried to dictate his company. There's one thing you never want to do is end up like Ted Turner where too many people start coming in and the next thing you know, you don't have your company anymore, right? So right now he's at 48%, which is... But I don't know who control. Nobody probably controls more than a certain percentage out of the different firms, the different people who are involved with um, owning the stock. And I would assume between the stock that Stephanie has and Shane has, because I know Shane sold some shares, but he didn't sell all his shares. So they probably, as the McMahon family, is still more than a fifty percent stakeholder in WWE. I. Probably wouldn't bet that Vince would ever let it be a situation where his family doesn't control the majority of the shares. So that was also interesting. Um, but it's just a, just an interesting thing. It's more of a business thing than anything to look at. All right. In other news in the wrestling world, uh, a big spot for the WWE. John Cena will host the ESPY Awards. Uh, scared, scheduled to air July 13th. Um Cena, the most noticeable figure of WWE in the last 15 years, uh, will be hanging out at the ESPYs, which is a big deal. Uh, one of the biggest sports awards in the world, uh, probably the biggest sports awards in the, awards, awards in the world. And uh, with the WWE's partnership with ESPN, uh, I guess this is a good byproduct of that situation. And this is going to be huge, man. I think it's a good look for the WWE. I think uh, Cena is a funny guy and engaging enough. I think he'll he'll work out and be a pretty good host for him. Uh, I think this will be a good spot for the company and for him. And I think it's a good look for ESPN also. So um, that's they'll bring a few extra eyes to the to the show. And speaking of Cena, he says he's about seventy percent uh, recovered from so- shoulder surgery, so uh, he should be back in the mix. His scheduled return date is the Memorial Day show for Raw. So everybody should have their eyes open for that Because that's going to be a big day and a big show And I'm sure they're going to try to make a splash Generally I don't think Raw does that well On Memorial Day for ratings So I think they're trying to use the Cena thing As a good way to propel them up ahead And try to uh, do some big things With the ratings Um, Also in WWE news NXT's uh, TakeOver That's scheduled for June 8th At Full Sail uh, The tag team titles will be defended uh, American Alpha will give a rematch to the Revival. Um, also, we know Finn Balor and Samoa Joe will have a steel cage match at that same event. Um, the event will be aired live on the WWE Network. I think it's going to be a huge, huge spot for NXT. Uh, 
Baylor's probably going to be his last match in NXT. I'm not going to see his last match because they never make it that climactic. But uh, this is kind of this is a very long feud if you think about it. Baylor and Joe have had like four matches for this title. This is the first time Joe is champion. But you kind of they've done about a few takeovers back and forth. I mean, so and you know the TV time. But because the way NXT is scheduled, the way they do the TV, since they're both not on every week, I think it allows the, the feud to breathe, and you're not over inundated with it like we're a Raw. If it was the, the champ and a challenger, they'd have two segments each on the show every single Monday, then maybe you might get tired of it a little more. But this seems like more like a classic wrestling feud, because feuds used to last like the whole year when we was kids. So, I think this is going to be kind of interesting. I, I'm interested to see what happens. And a steel cage match is a totally different view for NXT. Um, but having two experienced competitors like Joe and Baylor, I'm sure they'll be able to pull it off and make it look good for them. Um, in other news, uh, Emma will be out for an extended period of time. She is having back surgery. Uh, surgery is due to happen Wednesday, I believe, and we have not got a clear date of when she will be back. Uh, hopefully, she will, you know, come through surgery clean and everything will be okay. Um, in other women's news, Velvet Sky is wrapping up her tenure with TNA and is believed to be coming to the WWE. Um, who knows? Um, a lot of people do know behind the scenes she uh, dates Bubba Ray Dudley. And has been seen at some WWE events with Bubba. So people are hoping that maybe she could come over to the Performance Center and learn some things. And end up on the roster in the WWE. Um, not sure how much pull Bubba has backstage. And uh, I, I don't know. I've never really fully assessed Velvet's wrestling ability. Like, because that's the thing. If you go fit into this current roster, you got to be able to wrestle your butt off. And, I mean, she's held her own, but, I mean, when I think of classic knockout matches in TNA, Velvet's name doesn't really come to my head as much as, like, a Gail Kim or a uh, Taryn Terrell. Oh, man, remember that last women's standing match that they had? Woo-wee! That was brutal. But I don't really, you know, Velvet's name doesn't really pop into my head of, like, that tier of women who've had great matches in TNA. But that doesn't mean that she can't. She's not capable. But uh, we'll see what happens. But with that, um, I think that's all I got for news right now. I really don't have anything that's really jumping off the board. Um, I'm not offering any spoilers this week. And uh, pretty much what we're going to do is shut that down and come back and get you ready for Extreme Rules. And let's talk about what's going to go on at the pay-per-view. It has been said that anything can happen here in the World Wrestling Federation, but now more than ever, truer words have never been spoken. This is a conscious effort on our part to open the creative envelope, so to speak, in order to entertain you in a more contemporary manner. Even though we call ourselves sports entertainment because of the athleticism involved, the key word in that phrase is entertainment. The WWF extends far beyond the strict confines of sports presentation into the wide open environment of broad-based entertainment. We borrow from such program niches like soap operas, like the days of our lives, or music videos such as those on MTV, daytime talk shows like Jerry Springer and others, cartoons like the King of the Hill on Fox, sitcoms like Seinfeld, and other widely accepted forms of television entertainment. We in the WWF think that you, the audience, are quite frankly tired of having your intelligence insulted. We also think that you're tired of the same old simplistic theory of good guys versus bad guys. Surely the era of the superhero who urged you to say your prayers and take your vitamins is definitely passe. Therefore, we've embarked upon a far more innovative and contemporary creative campaign that is far more invigorating and extemporaneous than ever before. However, due to the live nature of Raw and the war zone, we encourage some degree of parental discretion as it relates to the younger audience allowed to stay up late. Other WWF programs on USA, such as Saturday Morning Live Wire and Sunday Morning Superstars, where there's a 40% increase in the younger audience, obviously, however, need no such discretion. 
We are responsible television producers who work hard to bring you this outrageous, wacky, wonderful world known as the WWF. Through some 50 years, the World Wrestling Federation has been an entertainment mainstay here in North America and all over the world. One of the reasons for that longevity is as the times have changed, so have we. I'm happy to say that this new vibrant creative direction has resulted in a huge increase in television viewership, for which we thank USA Network and TSN for allowing us to have the creative freedom, but most especially, we would like to thank you for watching. Raw and the War Zone are definitely the cure for the common show. So, let's talk WWE Extreme Rules 2016. Um, so, you know, Extreme Rules is, stems from matches being contested under hardcore wrestling regulations. Um, originally founded by Extreme Championship Wrestling, also known as ECW. Uh, the promotion originally used this term to describe the regulations of all the matches. Well, uh, WWE brought back ECW for one night stand in 2006, it, or actually, I think 2005 might be the first one. It was a smashing success. And then, yeah, actually, 2005 to 2006, uh, there were like basic reunion shows. Then 2007, WWE tried to do it again. They didn't do it in 2008. Then 2009, WWE brought it back as Extreme Rules as its own pay per view uh, with the idea of using these kind of matches. Now, as WWE does, it waters things down and tries to turn extra gimmick matches out of things that don't necessarily exist just to make it their own. But Neither here nor there. It has a pay per view that is barely going to be a part of the the roster for a while. Uh, originally, this one was scheduled for May first and was going to be in Chicago, but we ended up swapping that with Payback and the venues. We are going to be in New Jersey on Sunday, which is cool. I think New Jersey is a very good place. Uh, anytime you're in the Northeast, you go get a nice hot crowd. Um, you're going to get a smart crowd. <laughs> And they're ready to be entertained. And I think having the roster that you have now, I think you are in a good place. And you should be able to turn out a pretty good event. Um, so why not go down this card and find out who's wrestling. And let's figure out how we're going to um, book this event. So... Pretty much in the pre-show, we're going to have Baron Corbin versus Dolph Ziggler. There will probably be another throw-in match, but since we don't know what that's going to be, we're just going to leave that alone right now. Uh, Baron Corbin is going to beat Dolph Ziggler. I mean, there's no real rhyme reason for Dolph to win. And, I mean, this is the launch pad for Baron Corbin. Uh, this is his introductory feud. I think this is just a, the final day in it. It's a no-disqualification match, so... That's helpful for Dolph. Anytime I, it's kind of funny because a lot of people think that in a no DQ match, the underdog is at a disadvantage because the bigger person could be even more brutal. I look at a no DQ match as a chance for the underdog because they can now take a foreign object and use it as an equalizer. Now, I think Dolph will try to implement some of that, but at the end of the day, I think this is Corbin's time to shine. So. I'm booking Bear Corbin in the pre-show and call it that what it is. Uh, the New Day will take over the Walt Villiers for the tag team titles. This probably will open up the show. Uh, I don't see the Walt Villiers beating the New Day per se, clean. Uh, I don't think they will come out with the titles. More than likely, for what we've seen, I probably will see some kind of interference from somebody because here's the thing the New Day got three guys the Walt Villiers got two uh, they're not going to sit there not to mention they're just not going to lose to the Walt Villiers I mean they got the size advantage uh, Walt Villiers I guess overall may have quickness advantage but I don't think either one of them are quicker than Kofi Kingston right so I mean just trying to look at it just as a a wrestling match um, I think it goes Everything goes in the New Day's favor uh, But this is a pay-per-view I don't think we're going to get things that simple uh, The Valvillians did win the tag team tournament To get here Even though some people would challenge it They didn't necessarily win it Because the last match that they had Ended in no contest Because Enzo got hurt So so they, I mean they became the default tag team Because they was the Only full team left in the finals 
That being said, I don't think they're going to throw them away that early. But I don't think they're going to win the belts either. So, expect shenanigans. Uh, expect them to... Pro- if the Vaudevillians... I don't. I doubt they win. I think more likely New Day wins by DQ. And we got an issue with maybe the Dudleys or something like that. That would probably be the most logical scenario to come out of uh, that particular match. Next up on the docket, Kalisto will defend the United States Championship against Rusev. Rusev will have the lovely Lana in his corner. I'm not sure how that will be as much of a factor. Kalisto may have Sin Cara floating around. I don't know. Um, I I think Rusev was built up enough to give it a realistic idea that he had a shot, but I I don't think Rusev wins. I think this is Kalisto's time. I think he continues. I think they just need another opponent. And with Ryback being out, and we just plug Rusev back in. He is familiar with the United States title. I mean, he beat Zack Ryder in the battle to close out the battle royal. Uh, I'm gonna say that maybe, just maybe, we did somebody that we felt like was credible, but he's still about to take that L, right? I think that's just. I just think that's the result. I think he's about to take that L because I till till prove it otherwise. Rusev on the roster to take them L's. That's just what it is. I don't think they've got him position to do anything but to in the big spot lay it down. Uh, I don't. Nobody's really checking in on other than that. So we'll go with that. Um, Chris Jericho will take on Dean Ambrose in the first ever Asylum match as announced on Raw. So basically, they created a match for this pay-per-view and for this event. Uh, It is the Asylum match before Dean Ambrose. Now, would somebody lose their signature match in the first ever match of them having it? Probably not. Even though by WWF logic, that's a good way to happen. They may make you lose your old match the first time it ever happens. But <laughs> conventional wisdom says it's not what you should do. So I'm hopefully they're gonna go with conventional wisdom and say that's not what we're gonna do. Then we're gonna make sure the deed is taken care of. Um, especially considering, I think he's the future star. Jericho was I thought he would be going by now like I thought the last pay-per-view was that was it for his current run but I mean hey he looks like he's hanging around a little while longer so let's say if this match is his final pay-per-view match for this run until he decides to come back again and grace our presence uh it'll be cool it will set up you know different things so I think people will be you know, more able to deal with that kind of a thing. So, uh, you know, I think with Jericho, he'll be out on tour or whatever, and Dean Ambrose will just move to the next feud. But, uh, you know, we'll see how that all works out. But yeah, Dean Ambrose has to win his match. There's no way. Uh, and just to, from what I can look at, it looks like a modified steel cage match. With some mayhem going on. Like they've got some weapons and stuff like that. They just stashed around. And you know. The funny thing is. I'm like. If I want to get you a bloody match. I can get you a bloody match. Right. But because of PG product. And us not really having blood. We have to find a ways around to. Try to have the, the bad match. But try to find out a way to not have it so brutal. And so bad. And it's got to be weird. I don't know how guys go in and, you know, they don't work day punches or they get the bands up a certain way and still, you know, try not to bust somebody open. Try not to, or you go at full speed. You just start, y'all start shooting on each other, but you can't draw blood. You know what I mean? And that's got to be so weird. Because I, you know, I know a lot of people ain't blatant, but. Why do you legitimately get busted open the hard way? Because that's, that's a thing. But uh, I think they're going to keep that out of the mix. And yeah, Ambrose has the way to signature match. 
So that's where I would go with that one. Uh, Charlotte will defend the women's title against Natalia in a submission match. Uh, the stipulation for this match, Ric Flair is barred from ringside. So Daddy Dearest cannot save you, Charlotte. You have to figure it out on your own. Uh, that being said, yeah, it's going to be Charlotte and Daddy. Uh, I, I, I've got to give this to Charlotte. I've got to. It's. I think she's going to carry this belt for a minute. I think her winning it at WrestleMania says that we got a longer term plan for her with this idea. Because realistically, I felt like Sasha Banks should have walked out of WrestleMania as champ. But. I know a lot of other people felt that way too And they would have used that emotion To try to challenge it a different way Now <sighs> Pins on how this all works out But I, I I'll, I'm gonna go To exit Charlotte I, I think she keeps the belt And I mean this is really it I don't know There's nothing else really to talk about with that um, The Fatal 4 way is to be Probably will be matching the night it is the most interesting because I don't have a clear cut winner. Usually, even in a fatal four way or a three, a, you know, a three way, I've got a clear winner. Uh, Miz will defend his IC title against Kevin Owens, Cesaro, and Sami Zayn. Uh, these four have been beating the hell out of each other all week, as we talked about earlier in the show. And it's not even drawing the lines of heels and baby faces because both the heels can't stand each other's, and the baby faces don't seem to be warm and welcome to each other either. I don't even know where all that came from. Anyway, uh, so yeah, the baby face and heel dynamic is not even really prevalent in this situation. Uh, but if I had to pick one, I'm going to say the safest is. Uh, I don't even know if it's Cesaro. Uh, I think Miz just might retain. I think Miz can hold on to the belt. I think it's too many shenanigans and there's too many things going on for him to have to worry about a straight up match. And we'll find a way to kind of like screw himself over just enough. And bam, he's in the mix. So yeah, I'm going to say Miz keeps the belt. There's going to be a lot of belt keeping, just understand. Because there's no real place for these things to go. And also there's further storylines that have to be enhanced. Now, I think Miz keeps the belt. But I think all four of these guys still stay in play. Because Sami Zayn wants the IC title. He also needs to beat Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens wants the title. Also wants to beat Sami Zayn. Uh, Cesaro just wants a strap. Miz, he want to hold on to his status. I'm tired of being a beat up guy. I've been a beat up guy for a minute. I hit live WrestleMania. As he say. So, you know what I mean? Hey. It happens. Right? And I, I don't knock Miz for talking about it. Hell, Jericho still tell people that he beat Austin and Stone Cold in the same night. Austin is Stone Cold, but Austin and the Rock were both in the same night. So things happen, right? But uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, Miz will keep the belt. Uh, world title: Roman Reigns versus AJ Styles, Extreme Rules match. There's no rules, no count out. Families will be involved. So essentially, it'll be kind of like 303, more tornado style. So, pretty much, this is how we're going to do this style. Uh, I think Roman Reigns retains the title. Like, I don't I don't really see a reason why Roman Reigns will lose the belt. Uh, it would be a wonderful story for AJ to win. I think the crowd would be hot. It would be amazing if he won. I think Gallows and Anderson definitely give him a shot. But I think at the end of the day, I think Roman Reigns just... I think Because I think the big matchup is Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins. And that's what the money they want to set up for SummerSlam probably. Because Rollins never lost his belt. So he won his belt. So whoever has the belt is in Rollins' crosshairs. Right now, Roman makes the most sense. Um, do you turn him or whatever? That, that remains later to be seen. But I think right now you can do that and then... It would be, you know, AJ mixing it with his boys trying to figure out how they can further adapt to the American scene. But shout out to AJ Styles, the guy who came to the company five months ago, was now headlining the pay per view. Well, actually, his second pay per view headlining right after WrestleMania. I mean, wow. That has to be very aspirational for somebody who's in another locker room and think they have the skills. But 
Yeah, I think Roman Reigns wins, man. I, I just don't. There's no reason for him to lose. And uh, as I said, AJ will move on, and he will have another feud. He will get involved with somebody. Uh, there will be tensions between him, Gallows, and Anderson. And I don't know where that will lead the team ultimately. But, you know, hey, you got him. You got it here. Uh, is That's it. I mean, that's going to wrap it up, man. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the preview of uh, the pay-per-view. I uh, hope you enjoy our predictions or my predictions. And be back next week. Keisha should be back in the saddle. Uh, you don't know how hard it is to sit there and talk to yourself. But I think I got through it. And hopefully you guys enjoy the show. So with that, I am out. Peace.